and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome to Irreverent with me, Jamie Franklin. You are back with the show where we talk about faith and current affairs. I am a priest in the Church of England and normally I'm joined by my friends and colleagues, uh, Daniel and Tom, but today they are both unavailable. Daniel was due to uh, record a show with me, but he's been called away at the last minute with some important duties. So it's just me this week, Jamie Franklin, but hopefully I will be able to say some interesting things and you'll enjoy spending this time in my company. I hope so anyway. Um, there's lots to talk about. I'm actually on holiday this week. Uh, the weather has been lovely. I've just been spending some time with my family, doing a bit of writing, reading here and there. I've got some exciting things coming up. One of the things I've been doing is reading uh, Yerom Hazani's book, uh, on conservatism, which is just being released. It's just being published by Forum Press in this uh, country. And I have to say, I'm, I'm finding this book to be incredibly important to me personally, and I think it will be to many other people. So really, really looking forward to that interview when it comes about. I think it's, mm, I can't quite remember actually, so I won't say when, but it's but it's coming up. But that book, Conservatism, uh, A Rediscovery, um, it's a fantastic book and I think really, really important. So I've been enjoying doing that and a few other bits. Now, a really important announcement is that Irreverend finally has its own dedicated website. So I won't be telling you various website addresses for all the different stuff we've got going on. You can just go to our website, uh, which looks nice and smart. It's not particularly complicated at the moment. At the moment, it's just a, a one-stop shop for most of the stuff that's associated with the reverend in one form or another. So the address is simply irreverendpod.com. That's irreverendpod.com. And there you can go, you can find our latest episodes. You can find um, how to support the show on patreon.com and buymeacoffee.com. And uh, you can find our contact details and so on. So the website is up now. So please do use that website. And if you ever want to share the show with your family or friends, uh, you have only to uh, to go on that website uh, or at least to, to share the address, irreverendpod.com. And as time goes on, we'll doubtless be adding stuff to the site as well. Um, we are very much uh, working on developing some merchandise, which I'm quite excited about, which we'll certainly put on that site as well. But for the time being, irreverendpod.com, uh, you can watch the episodes on there. You can listen to the episodes. Uh, and as I say, you can uh, support what we're doing uh, just by going there. Speaking of which, if you like this show and you appreciate what we're doing and you'd like to see the enterprise uh, expand, please do consider making a contribution to us. Um, you can become a monthly sponsor of the show for as little as £1.50 a month, plus VAT in this country, which isn't very much really, um, on patreon.com, patreon.com forward slash reverend. But as I say, you can just find a big red button uh, with Patreon written on it at our website, reverendpod.com. And if you don't want to subscribe in that way, but you'd like to just show your appreciation for what we're doing, you can buy us a coffee. That's a virtual coffee, not a real coffee. Uh, which amounts to simply making a one-time donation online. And again, you can go to irreverendpod.com and find the big yellow button and buy us a coffee there, or you can go to buyusacoffee.com forward slash irreverend. Uh, also, our social media is all on, on our website, our Twitter and our Telegram uh, in particular. Uh, do email the show if you'd like to get in touch, irreverendpod at gmail.com. And those, I think, are all the notices uh, for this week. Oh, no, I did actually want to read out a couple of the comments from, from Buy Me A Coffee. So I'll just, um, I'll just do that quickly. So I've actually logged out. Silly silly me, not being, not being properly ready for the show. I'm just going to log, log in and, and read a couple of these comments out because it's really nice on Buy Me A Coffee because you can uh, leave a comment when you support us. And um, it's nice to read these comments. So uh, I'll just read some of them out. Um, we've got an Australian supporter, anonymous Australian supporter, who says, keep up the good work, immensely thoughtful material. And thank you very much. Car, someone called Car, C-A-R, bought a coffee and said, Jamie, Daniel and Tom, thank you for boldly speaking the truth. So encouraging. We've got another 
another donation by Eoz J Rock, uh, who says, "Thank you for the excellent podcast. Have have a cup cup of tea, or maybe a flask on me." Very nice. Another person. Uh, many people have mentioned not coffee but tea, seeing as we're we're Anglican vicars. Um, Chris bought four coffees. Said one each and one for the big time. Rosemary said, "You definitely all need a coffee on me. So much appreciate your de- delightful scriptural." and spiritual banter and here we have another one from uh someone who says thanks thought i was lost and now i'm found from a cold and wet northern england in the driest hottest summer ever well i'm not sure about the meteorological meteorological claim there it might be correct it might not but really appreciate that uh, that's really nice of you so if you'd like to buy us a coffee please do on, go on uh, buymeacoffee.com forward slash reverend or reverendpod.com and uh, same thing for patreon you can find it on our website or go to patreon.com forward slash reverends so i'm going to talk about football in a minute and i know not all of our audience or perhaps even most of our audience are interested in football Um, But I do think that the uh, way that football is being uh, used is very, very interesting from a political perestective and and interesting uh, from a from a Christian, from a faith perspective as well. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, But first, I am going to uh, read a bit of scripture and. I don't I've been thinking about what scripture to do this week, and we often do a scripture which is sort of, you know, an attempt to link in the scripture with the events of the day uh, in a way which is hopefully sort of insightful. But I couldn't really sort of think of anything in that vein this week. So I'd like to just read something which is uh, encouraging, uh, which is from uh, Isaiah chapter 40. And you may have heard uh, this these verses before, but I just encourage you to uh, to listen again afresh. And then I'm going to say a prayer and then we will talk about some current events. So this is uh, Isaiah 40, um, starting at verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Such an encouraging passage because it reminds us that we don't have to do things in our own strength, but we can rely on the Lord's power working in and through us in our lives and i know a lot of the time when things are difficult it doesn't feel like the lord's power is working through us but nevertheless we can still uh, draw close to the lord through prayer and through meditation on scripture and in other ways as well like going to church and joining in with corporate worship and in the sacraments and so on so I hope that's an encouragement to people to draw close to the Lord, um, especially if you're finding thing di- things difficult. It's one of the things that we come across uh, so much in the people who get in touch with us on the show is, is that there are lots of people who are incredibly disturbed by the events that they see in the world around them in, in our country and the, and the nations of the world wars and rumors of wars and so on and so forth. Um, But it's important to recognize that we who follow Christ, who believe in God and his power in our lives and in the world, uh, rely on him for our strength and ultimately look to him for deliverance. And this is really the only answer I have to give to anyone who who has those problems. And I'm sorry, but I suppose you would expect a, a priest to say something like this, is that we look to God for our deliverance and our help and our strength. And I hope that's in some way encouraging. Anyway, I'll say a, a quick prayer and then uh, we, will, um, we will talk about some stuff. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so let's talk about football. Now, I grew up going to watch football, uh, going to watch Tottenham Hotspur um, in North East London and watching Match of the Day and getting really excited, you know, when uh, big footballing tournaments would come around. I mean, a huge one for me was uh, Euro 96. When I was, um, I suppose I was about nine years old and I was seriously invested in that football tournament. And it wasn't just me, but the whole nation. Now, you might remember that that, that tournament was set in, in England. And that's where we got the song Football's Coming Home from, because it was written for that tournament, for the fact that the tournament was in England, but also the, the symbolic sense that football was coming home because we were going to win the Euros. And football, in inverted commas, you know, football in glory was coming home to the place um, in which football was invented or at least propagated in its modern form. And so football is something that's been passed down to me uh, from, from my father, from the previous generation. It is something that I've always loved and it's something that I still love. And um, that might not be something that, that resonates with you. You might not love football, but I'm sure you, I'm sure you know what that sense of having something passed down to you from a previous generation and, and loving and treasuring that thing feels like um, it's a it's a great thing. Now, I'm deeply deeply disturbed by the way that football is being used as a tool of social engineering in the modern day. And as far as I can remember, I don't think this has been going on for that long. Certainly, some years, but not maybe not more than ten years. I would say um, the fact is is that this has gone way beyond. Um, this has gone way beyond concern and legitimate concern about um, there being racist um, and abusive chanting and things like that. Football is now being used as a tool of social engineering. Now, sport being used in this way is obviously not new, sport and entertainment. I'm sure there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on in, in, uh, in the Roman Empire with emperors staging games for their own glory to um to satiate the masses and all that kind of stuff so i'm not suggesting this is anything new um but this this is happening in a really aggressive way uh, in football in this country and i'll get on to the premier league in a moment but um obviously this week we've had the uh the thrilling denouement of the uh, women's Euros. Um, now, I, I have to um, make a, um, a disclosure at the beginning of this and say that I've never watched a single game of women's football. So I can't comment on it in terms of uh, the quality of the football. Um, I've heard different things. Uh, I've, heard, uh, I've heard pretty unanimously that some years ago that the standard was quite poor. Some people say that the standards improved quite significantly now. Other people say that the standard is still um, not, not great. Um, I couldn't comment on that personally. So that's not really what I want to say in this, in this segment, that, that women's football is, is rubbish or anything like that, because I haven't, I haven't watched it. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of deeply committed uh, people in women's football. But what I um, find objectionable about women's football is that it is being it is being and has been for a few years i don't know how long not very long at all maybe three years or so maybe three or four years it's being it's being pushed relentlessly uh particularly uh by the bbc and uh, you can see that i i to my um i don't know what not my shame but to my um, and maybe I should have, maybe I should have deleted it is what I'm saying, but I still have the BBC sport app because I like looking at the football, uh, but it's becoming increasingly, it's becoming increasingly hard to find anything about men's football on the BBC sports app now, because, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more dominated by uh, stories about the women's game. 
after the uh, final of the Euros, uh, the first 13 stories on the BBC uh, football uh, sport app in the football sections, the first 13 stories were about women's football. You had to go uh, down to story number 14 to find anything about men's football, even though the Premier League is, is starting this season. Anyway, it seems to me that um, women's football has been pushed relentlessly uh, over the last few years. And I see I see behind this in general, and there are other things to talk about a bit more specifically in a minute, but in general, this is no doubt due to a kind of liberal discomfort with the fact that you have this sport, which is immensely popular, uh, which is played by men, and that there isn't a female equivalent, or at least there's not a female equivalent, which is in any way as anywhere near as popular as the men's game. The English Premier League is, is the most popular football league in the world, and it's one of the most popular sporting leagues in the world. So what, what they've been doing is they've been trying to push women's football and to, to give the impression that women's football is on the same level as, as men's football, uh, mm -hmm. that it's the same level of cultural importance and that we should take it as seriously. And once again, this is because, or this is in the service of the liberal idea that there should be complete equality um, between the sexes. Now, when, when I say equality here, I don't mean equality before the law or anything like that. I mean equality in the sense that there's no difference, that it's all just the same. We've got men's football and we've got women's football. And these things, you know, these things are the same as each other and they should they should be taken as seriously as each other. So so there's a sort of artificiality about it in this sense. Um, I haven't looked at any stats, but we all know clearly that women's football is, is not anywhere near as culturally important as men's football. And nevertheless, it's treated as though it is. And, and you can see that in the way that the women's uh, English, uh, sorry, the English women's team has appropriated um, narratives and tropes associated with men's football. So I mentioned earlier, uh, it's coming home, which was obviously written uh, for the men's team. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with women's football. It, it, the narrative of the song doesn't make sense if you apply it to women's football. For example, there's the, 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 the lyrics, 30 Years of Hurt, which is referring back from 1996 to 1966 when the men won the World Cup. So it's been 30 years of not winning anything. Um, it's been 30 years of hurt. It doesn't make any sense if you sing a song uh, which is which is um, written about a men's football team with a certain historical narrative and then apply it to a women's team in that way. But nevertheless, the women have appropriated it. And there was this um, now sort of famous conga line of, of the women after they'd won uh, the match. You know, the, 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 the coach was giving a press conference. And they, all, they all came in in a conga line singing, it's coming home, it's coming home, it's coming, football's coming home. Now, look, I know I know that this is going to sound like I'm some kind of um, some fogey who's trying to sort of ruin everyone's fun, but I do find it um, really quite irritating how that song has been appropriated by appropriated by and applied to women's football because the 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 whole point of that song is about. The, the sense of nostalgia and longing that has been built up over decades by England football fans who consistently are being let down and heartbroken by their team. And, the, and the, thing that, the thing that makes it even more poignant is what actually happened in Euro 96, where we lost the semi-final. We should really have won it. We had, we had some great, we had a great team, great players. It was our best chance to win a tournament ever. And we still messed it up. And we continue to mess it up. And the, the pain and the hurt continues to get worse. And England fans know what that feels like. We share that in common. It's a, culturally, um, it's a cultural commonality that we share with one another. And it's associated with the men's game. It's got nothing at all to do with the women's game. The women's game, to, to the vast majority of the people, is completely novel, even if they even if they like it. And you can't just you can't just impose that set of that set of feelings and cultural connotations and that narrative uh, upon uh, the women's game. It just doesn't. It just doesn't work. It's it's a it is a form of appropriation, which is which is an inappropriate form 
But nevertheless, as I say, it's, it's all in the service of this drive to absolute sameness and ostensible equality between, between the, the sexes. So uh, that's the first thing I want to say about it. I think it's, I think it's in general, a form of a form of social engineering which is being used in order to advance a, a liberal agenda. And again, not saying anything about the quality of women's football. I've never watched it, but observe the the aggressiveness of the way that it's being pushed in our culture. And I, I'm willing to bet way way beyond its revenue or its level of of organic popularity or anything like that perhaps you don't agree with me about that but that's the way i feel about it um i feel like it's a manipulative social engineering the second thing as i say i did not watch the women's euros final didn't watch it but there were a number of things that happened which i have heard about um and if you doubt that there is a political agenda which is piggybacking upon women's football, then just observe this uh, checklist. So the women's football, um, there was an all-female hurricane flyover of the stadium. There was all-female commentary. Uh, The female players took the knee before the kickoff. There was a uh, rainbow car delivering the ball. So that's another thing. There were rainbow captain's armbands. Uh, there is a there is a team in uh, sorry there is a couple within the England team who are uh, a lesbian couple. There were Ukrainian referees. There was an all female uh, pre show, uh, all female singers pre show, and then of course at the end there was the the uh, in inverted commas iconic and empowering. Women winning celebration, which consisted of a woman uh, taking her top off so that she was just in her bra. Now, perhaps that was spontaneous. Um, perhaps it wasn't. I, I think it's very likely that that was planned. The whole notion of it being iconic and empowering, you could, you could almost predict that the BBC would write an article using the words iconic and empowering uh, to describe uh, a woman taking her shirt off uh, after after she scored a goal. And indeed, that's what uh, they did. This was iconic and empowering. This was empowering for women's, women everywhere uh, to be able to take their shirts off and to run around in their bras. Now, you see here, and again, um, I'm not necessarily making any value judgments about any of this, but I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can guess what I think. Um, what's being pushed here? The, the idea of... Um, absolute sameness between the sexes, uh, the LGBT agenda, you know, rainbow flags everywhere. Uh, You've also got um, Ukrainian uh, referees. Uh, What has has the Ukraine-Russia conflict got to do with women's football? Absolutely nothing. Now, the the only way that you can understand this is to realise that football... In general, this applies to the men's game, which I'll come on to in a minute, but football is being used as a vehicle of social engineering. And this is part of what it means to live in a politically totalitarian society where nothing, nothing can exist in the common public space without it carrying some kind of political connotation and ideology. And indeed, that is the the definition of totalitarianism politics everywhere you can't just watch football because football is entertaining no 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 football has to be a vehicle of social change of political change the 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 ideology of the party must be transmitted through everything including football and that's what's going on in women's football and that's what's also going on in men's football now, I mean, where do you start with this? Where do you start with the taking taking of a knee of the knee, taking of the knee gesture? Um, Gareth Southgate, very upset he was at one stage because uh, Premier League players, oh no, it wasn't, it was England players, sorry. England players taking the knee and people were booing. And he said, I can't imagine why anyone, why anyone, I just can't imagine 
I've been racking my brains and I can't imagine why anyone would boo that gesture. So benign, so unambiguously positive and affirmative of equality between different races. It, it, it just, it, it, it boggles my mind that anyone could have a problem with players taking the knee before football matches. Why, why, why could that possibly be? Gareth Southgate wondered. But maybe it's because they're all racists. And, and we've, we've, heard, we've heard over and over again, uh, Southgate and the England football players talking about the way that what they need, uh, you know, this problem with fans booing the knee, um, booing the taking the knee, uh, what, what needs to happen is actually more uh, education. So the problem is that the fans are racist and that they are uneducated. That's the that's problem. They're booing because they don't understand, they're not properly educated, unlike the Premier League football players who are, you know, extremely well educated. Uh, the, the, the fans, they're, they're stupid, they're ignorant, they're racist, they need more education. And the way that we're going to educate them is by simply continuing to take the knee. And, uh, and that, will, that will sort them out, that will sort out the problem. Now, it's got nothing at all to do with the fact that fans find this um, annoying, patronising, and that they don't like the politicisation of football, they find the importation of this baffling American virtue signaling gesture to be uh, something distasteful and that they don't want in the traditional English game of football. It's got nothing to do with any of that. They're just racist and stupid. But what we've seen this week is that the Premier League captains, they all got together and they had a they had a meeting. So it's the Premier League season coming up. Uh, lots of football fans are really excited about it. Premier League season's coming up. Uh, the captains all got together, and they they discussing should we should we continue taking the knee, or perhaps um, should we maybe do something else now? Um, now, why are they doing this? Not really sure because they've been taking the knee relentlessly uh, following the uh, death of George Floyd in uh, May two thousand and twenty. So for over two years, they've been doing this. But now they have decided that Premier League players will stop the pre-match anti-racism gesture of taking the knee before every match. Now, some people have suggested this is because uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has taken a downturn in popularity uh, recently since the, um, the, f- the founders of the movement have been sp- spending millions of pounds, um, millions of dollars buying mansions, opulent mansions and doing things like that. Um, who knows? Who knows why they've decided to do this? But anyway, they've, they've taken this uh, decision, apparently after consulting with players, but the gesture will uh, still be seen uh, before certain rounds of games, including the Boxing Day fixtures and cup finals, and also uh, before the first round of matches and the last round of matches as well. Captains of players, I'm reading for the BBC website here, captains and players have said to believe that, quote, less is more, hoping when the knee is taken, it will have greater impact. Well, let's see how that goes. Not sure about that logic there. Not sure about that reasoning. Quotation, we have decided to select significant moments to take the knee during the season to highlight our unity against all forms of racism. And in so doing, we continue to show solidarity for a common cause, said a joint statement from the Premier League captains. Now, here's the most important thing. Take a swig of coffee before I say this. This is the most important thing. We remain resolutely committed to eradicate racial prejudice and to bring about an inclusive society with respect and opportunities for all. So there you go. That's it. It's not just that they don't like racism in football. They don't like football players being racially uh, abused. Uh, which, you know, is something which is obviously abhorrent. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't want that for players either. What they actually want is they want to eradicate racial prejudice and to bring about an inclusive society with respect and equal opportunities for all. So, in other words, they want to use football as a vehicle for a political program program to bring about an inclusive society and that those those words inclusive society that those two words inclusive society that that has an enormous amount of political baggage this is what this um 
this uh, liberal terminology often does it, is it uses words which sound nice but which have all sorts of connotations uh, which lots of people may find objectionable so football players want to bring about an inclusive society with respect and equal opportunities for all is that the purpose of football i thought the purpose of football was entertainment but no the purpose of football is to bring about a political end and then this thing just goes on and on and on about um about this gesture I mean, it's an incredibly long article uh, talking about you know the need to tackle discrimination and inclusion and so on and so forth um it's in, it's interesting that the uh, premier league captains have not spoken to fans about it uh, they haven't consulted with fans and um if they had done they would probably be told that the gesture uh, is something that fans uh, object to and they find immensely irritating now it's perfectly possible to make a gesture against racism within football without um, virtue signaling to Black Lives Matter. Um, I've heard, for example, Toby Young um, suggesting that they could, uh, you know, do a sort of um, a sort of uh, sort of hugging gesture, you know, where they all where they all stand around with their arms uh, sort of interlinked or something like that, all the players together, and just do that before the before the the game to to symbolise. And it actually would symbolise, unlike the taking the knee, which just doesn't meaningless gesture. Uh, that would symbolise unity amongst the players. They would say, "Look, we're all one, right? We're playing competitive sport. Uh, this is a competitive game, but nevertheless, look, we respect each other." And that then could be reflected in the the way they play and so on and so forth. But but this taking the knee gesture is taken from uh, an American. Uh, Marxist, neo-Marxist group, uh, Black Lives Matter, and imported into the English game of football. And that's why uh, people don't like it. It's actually um, a sort of uh, an anti-American gesture in many ways. Uh, it was inspired by the NFL player Colin Kaepernick, uh, who knelt during the national anthem of the US rather than um, standing. So, it's, so there are connotations, there are kind of... Um, uh, you know, anti-patriotic or anti-nationalistic connotations uh, to it as well. So the idea that this is just some kind of neutral anti-racism gesture is, is completely is complete nonsense, and everyone knows it. Um, so anyway, that's for me. That's uh, that's what's been animating me a bit this week. I've been thinking a bit about that, and I, I really find it to be a shame because um, this kind of thing it, it spoils things that we love in our lives. Now, as I say. For you, it might not be football; it might be something else. But this this encroachment of politics into everything, it means that you can't actually enjoy these things in the way that you used to. Now, for me, I still really enjoy the football, and I'm I'm really looking forward to to the coming season. You know, I'm a Spurs fan. I think Spurs have got a great chance of doing all sorts of great things this season. But you have to kind of overlook this nonsense. You have to kind of turn a blind eye to it because it's so invasive. And it, it just sort of takes the edge off things. You just think, why can't we just enjoy this thing for what it is, which is a, which is a brilliant sport, a, 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 a celebration of human excellence, uh, of skill, of quality, of power, of strength, which is what sport is meant to be about. Why do we have to have this insipid political ideological agenda in absolutely everything and why have these players bought into it so deeply why aren't there any premier league players who say Look, i'm not having any of this nonsense i just i just not i'm not participating in it i just want to play football i don't want to do this blm neo-marxist virtue signaling i'm here to play football and i let my football do the talking oh for a high play, high profile football player who would show some backbone and object to this uh, nonsense. Um, the uh, what's the name of the uh, basketball player? Um, ah, I forget his name. The guy who plays for Orlando Magic. I'm looking it up now. What is his name? I read his book. He was somebody. Yeah, Jonathan Isaac. Um, his book is called Why I Stand. He refused to take the knee when the NBA uh, started up again after. Um, after COVID lockdowns, he refused to take it. It's a black player. He refused to take it because he recognized that the BLM movement is not about peace and unity at all. It's about um, neo-Marxist uh, social engineering. It's actually about division and warfare and conflict between the races. Uh, inspired, um, it inspired riots across 
uh, across America, which have cost hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. Jonathan Isaacs recognized all of this, and he alone took the decision, the brave decision, to stand there while all of his uh, teammates knelt in obsequience to the cult of Black Lives Matter. And he was ostracized to a certain extent, and scorn and derision was pour- poured on him because he would not conform to their um, virtue signaling uh, behavior. And he, he did this, by the way, um, out of his Christian conviction, because he did not think that Black Lives Matter and, and what it represents tallies with his, um, his convictions as a Christian and good for him. And I'd like to see more footballers doing that kind of thing. Well, I'd like to see any footballers doing that kind of thing uh, to show that they're not just going to allow themselves to be co-opted into this, uh, this political agenda, which is what they're doing at the moment. You know, the way they talk, it's, it's as though they've, you know, it's as though they're sort of deeply politically um, informed and committed to them, themselves. They're not. They're just being used. They're being used by the powers that be, the people who are behind the scenes, who are pulling the strings, they're being used by them. They're being told, look, you should do this thing because it's because it's uh, it's the right thing for society. Now, I don't imagine that any Premier League footballers uh, listen to this podcast, although they might. If they do, stop taking the knee. Stop taking it for good. Just stand there. Stand there while all the other people virtue signal and pay homage to uh, the neo-Marxist um, anti-civilizational movement, Black Lives Matter, just stand there, say, look, I'm not going to do it. You know, shoot me. You need me. To, you need me to play football. You need me to play in your football team. You need me to score the goals or to, to defend or, or be a midfield playmaker. I'm not going to take the knee. I'm not going to do it. You'd get respect. You'd get huge amount of respect from your fans if you did that, because the fans hate it. Ask anyone who goes to uh, Millwall. Anyway, that's the end of that. Um, I just... It's quite good, actually, Daniel and Tom not being here because it gives me the opportunity to to offload like this. So that's the main thing I I wanted to say uh, this week. Uh, There are a number of other things I could talk about, but I think I'll I'll leave it really until next week. Um, We're still in a position in this country where we're waiting to see who the next uh, prime minister is going to be. I'm not particularly excited about this. Um, I I think we need a a complete overhaul of uh, and renewal of political life in this country with people who are actually committed conservatives and ideally uh, people who are Christians as well. Um, That's not happening in this leadership election. And so I'm not particularly excited about it. Although Liz Truss has said that she wouldn't have any more lockdowns and that that is um, something that she was always not particularly comfortable with. Hard to comment on that from my perspective. It seems to me like she was um, part of the cabinet for the best part of two years while lockdowns were going on. So if she was uncomfortable about it, she didn't say anything publicly. But nevertheless, it's a good sign because it shows that um, the Tory um, the Tory base, the, the members of the Tory party um, are against lockdowns because otherwise she wouldn't have said it because everything's about opinion polls. So that's probably a good sign. And hopefully it's a sign that within the wider public as well, people recognise how absolutely disastrous um, lockdowns were, how terrible they were for people, how they damaged people's um, mental health, how they damaged people's physical health, how they caused ruptures in the fabric of society, uh, in family life as well, in the lives of friends and uh, friendship groups and so on and so forth, how they're having catastrophic effects. They continue and they will continue to have catastrophic effects for the developing world, plunging hundreds of millions of people into abject poverty. Uh, The consequences of lockdown are are appalling beyond belief. And um, my only hope is that uh, people, uh, public opinion will continue to turn against them until they become an unthinkable thing and that the connotations of the word lockdown are unbearable. Now, I'm not, I'm not, com- I'm not comparing these things. Uh, I'm not saying there's an equivalence between them. But when nowadays we say a word like apartheid, uh, we shudder. And we and we th- and we think of it. We instinctively think of it and feel that it's something that is is not acceptable. It's not an acceptable suggestion politically. Apartheid, and it should be the same thing with lockdowns. It should just be like, why did we ever do that? Why did we ever think that that was a good idea? It is completely unprecedented. We'd never done anything like that before. Uh, there was no there was no plan, pre-existing plan to lock our country down. We got the idea 
from the Chinese Communist Party, who are completely evil. They have uh, they have no respect for the individual dignity of their citizens, uh, and they applied this totalitarian, authoritarian, utilitarian solution to the problem, and we in the West copied it to our shame, to our absolute shame. And the population in our country was brainwashed by the media, and most notably, of course, by the BBC, into accepting this and thinking that this was somehow some gesture, well, it's, uh, thinking that the acceptance of it was some kind of suggestion gesture, sorry, of, uh, of collective uh, responsibility and support as though, we're, as though we were in a war, you know, as though we we're back in World War Two or something like that. It was a shameful episode in our history. The consequences of it are only just being felt. And my only hope is that our next prime minister actually, who probably will be Liz Truss, actually follows through with this and that we don't see any more of these horrendous lockdowns, which are in every way um, foolish they don't work. They don't stop the spread of. Well, they didn't stop the spread of COVID, uh, and they've caused enormous uh, damage in our country. Now, another one other thing I'll say. Uh, something I saw in the news was was Jeremy Corbyn, who, according to the Daily Telegraph, has been criticised. Um, oh, sorry, has been criticising the UK for prolonging the war in Ukraine. Now, I don't. Um, <laughs> I don't see eye to eye with Jeremy Corbyn ideologically. I'm sure he doesn't care what I think, but of course I don't. I don't see eye to eye with him in in all sorts of ways. And I think there are lots of question marks about some of the things that he stands stands for. But I have to say, I think Corbyn has got it right on this one. Um, Corbyn has criticised the UK and the West for supplying Ukraine with weapons, saying, "quote Pouring arms in will only quote prolong and exaggerate uh, the war." Mr. Corbyn said it was disappointing that hardly any of the world leaders use world's leaders use the word peace when discussing the conflict, claiming too many use the language of more and more bellicose war. And the way that, of course, this is um, argued against in the in the West is that what we see here is a, a situation with with Putin that is basically analogous to Hitler. Um, in the Second World War, and that you can't you can't give in to um, you can't give in to totalitarian despots. So we need to uh, we need to prolong the war in Ukraine by um, by sending them weapons and so on. And and everybody knows that this is driving up the the um, the price of fuel, and it's probably going to cause a global famine. Uh, Rishi Sudak, one of the uh, contenders for the uh, the position of prime minister, said this week that we are uh, paying sorry that paying uh, higher fuel bills is the price that we must pay for um, for supporting Ukraine in the Ukraine Russian war. Now that's uh, that's fine for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? Because he's a multimillionaire, but for the poor people in this country who this is going to affect. Um, it's not so fine because they won't be able to afford uh, fuel in their cars. So they won't be able to afford to go to work or they won't be able to afford to take their kids to school. And indeed, they won't be able to afford to heat their homes and they may become unwell. They may die from the cold. But it's OK, says Rishi Sunak, because uh, we're supporting Ukraine. And this, for some reason, is our duty as a nation. Now, I think that this is uh, an abrogation of responsibility on the part of any politician who advocates for it, because politicians are meant to take care of the people within their own nation. Now, regardless of who's right and who's wrong in the Russian-Ukrainian war, um, that should be politicians in our country's uh, primary responsibility. Now, you might say, well, that seems a bit um, seems a bit mercenary, doesn't it? I mean, shouldn't we think about the well-being of all um, people in the world? Well, yeah, in an abstract sense, yes, but nevertheless. We have responsibilities in our own, uh, in our individual sphere. Okay, so we have so politicians in this country are elected to represent the interests of their constituents. Take an analogy. Um, I have four children and a wife, and it's my responsibility to take care of them. Now, I might have I might have um, other responsibilities, you know, in a, in a more general sense to my neighbour or to people who live 
further away from me. But my primary responsibility is for my children and my wife and my family. So it wouldn't be right if I went and and tried to help some people, say, who lived in another country to the detriment of my own family. That would be wrong. That would be an immoral thing to do. Now, I would suggest that exactly the same thing is happening with Western politicians who are pouring arms into Ukraine in order to prolong this war in the belief, I suppose, that it will eventually um, end with Ukraine what, keeping all of its territory and repelling Russia. Seems pretty unlikely to me. But anyway, that's what they're doing. And they, as a result, are willing to accept the fact that people in our country are going to become impoverished. Now, I think this is wrong. I think this is immoral. And I think they shouldn't be doing it. And as much as I think that Corbyn is a questionable character for all sorts of reasons, um, I think he's right on that one. That's my opinion. So that's that. There's a couple of um, a couple of news stories. Now, I'd like to finish, and I, I will finish in a minute. As I say, I'm kind of enjoying this. It's kind of, you know, it's quite freeing, you know, for me to just do this by myself as much as I miss uh, Daniel and uh, Tom being with me. I'd like to finish with some a bit of question the ref. So uh, here we go. Once again, we're back with Question the Rev. I've got quite a lot of good questions this week, actually, and it's going to be hard for me to sort of uh, choose between them. So uh, I'm going to do a few. So here we go. Let's find this. Uh, I did have it all up, but now it's disappeared, as is always the case with technology. I mean, this is, you know, it's all very sort of, um, I don't know, what's the, what's the word? We, we're not professional outfit here. We're, we're, we're not professional broadcasters. We're, we are uh, priests. So sometimes these things happen. All right. OK, so here we go. So somebody has asked. So I put this on our Telegram group, which you can join, by the way, t.me forward slash irreverence. So somebody has asked about how to uh, read the Bible. They want to read the Bible. They haven't picked it up since school. Um, do I just start at the beginning? Which version would you recommend? Now, uh, this is a question we come across um, quite a lot. And uh, I do commend you for um, for wanting to read read the Bible. It's really, it's really great. And so just tips, I, I'll just give you some tips. Um, when you first come to the Bible, um, I would use, uh, personally, I would use a modern um, a translation that is in um, some form of modern English. Um, it, the King James Version is is the great English translation of scripture. So um, I, I, I think a familiarity with it is really good. But, you know, first time, I personally recommend reading either the New King James Version or the English Standard Version, or you can get hold of it, the uh, the Revised Standard Version. I don't uh, recommend the New Revised Standard uh, Version because it uses um, uh, a, a so-called gender-inclusive translation philosophy, which actually obscures the meaning of the text. So I don't like the the new revised standard English, uh, new revised standard version for that reason. But I would say English standard version, um, the new King James version or King James version, if you if you can get with the um, the um, slightly more arcane English. Now, personally, I would just try and find um, some kind of Bible reading plan online. There are lots of Bible reading plans online and just and just stick with that or get yourself a lectionary, you know, the Church of England lectionary or the Book of Common Prayer lectionary. Um, that's just it's, it's essentially a, a plan of, of stuff you read every day. Something like that is really good. Or if you want to take it in your own pace, you could do something like read a, a chapter of Genesis um, start at the beginning and just work your way through chapter a day from Genesis onward, work your way through the Old Testament, do the same thing concurrently in the New Testament, uh, just a chapter a, a day from the Old Testament and the New Testament. I find journaling um, really helpful, writing down what you see, what you understand, um, how the scripture speaks to you, which is really the point of um, reading scripture. Um, and do, you could do it that way as well. Or you could pick a, pick a particular book and, and read through it slowly. And, and pray that God would open your heart and your mind to um, understand uh, the scriptures. So that's that's the way I'd sort of um, begin and uh, go from there and see how you go. Um, so that's that. Um, as, as I say, there's so much more to say there. But um, if you're just getting into it, you know, maybe try something like that. And again, if it doesn't work, you know, try something else. Try a different way of doing it. There's no one magical way. Um, just try different stuff. Now, another one um, 
from Jane. Uh, do you see your Telegram followers and podcast listeners, etc., as your flock? Um, meaning, do I see myself as sort of um, the the or you know, did I and Daniel and, and Tom do we see ourselves as kind of priests of of the people who um, listen? The the answer is no. I'm, I have to say, I uh, love our listeners and. Um, uh, you know, I'm really, really grateful for all the support we get. And I'm glad that the show does something for you. But what we provide for you on this podcast is not um, proper pastoral and priestly care and guidance. Um, you can only be given that by an actual priest or a pastor who you know, and um, who can care for your soul, can be a doctor of your soul as an individual. I can't do that. Um, Daniel can't do that. Tom can't do that because we don't know you. And we don't have a we don't have a, a fully um, orbed human relationship. Uh, it's a completely different thing, you know. Listening to us on the podcast, interacting with us via social media or email, um, it's a different thing. It's it's a great thing, and I, I'm glad it's part of my life, and I'm glad it's part of your life as well, um, if you are. Uh, but it's not the same. And I always say, um, you know, I believe in the church. Uh, I believe that the church is is absolutely necessary for the Christian life. I understand it's difficult because lots of churches are extremely disappointing, um, which in many ways is to be expected because um, they are um, they are marred by, by human sin, as all institutions are. It's very sad that the church is, and it's, in many ways it's sad, the situation of the Church of England at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, um, find a church. Find somewhere you can go to church. And if the if you can't find somewhere or, or the places you've been are disappointing and, and, and you, you've not been able to stick there, then keep looking and, and pray that God would, would, would lead you to somewhere and, and lead you to some appropriate priestly and pastoral support um, because you can't receive it just from listening to a podcast. So I, I think that that's such an important thing. And um, I would, I would uh, suggest that and recommend that. Um, very strongly um one more where is it some there was a good there was a good one here oh. mm. no i can't oh yeah this is a good one so this is from austin so how do we know the difference between what we can change i.e that which is within our free will and that which is divinely ordained is it just lazy thinking to dismiss unpleasant events as the will of god Oh, man, this is a this is a metaphysically complex question. So I'll have a sip of coffee before I attempt an answer. Now, God has given us human beings causal agency in this world, by which I mean He has made us causes. So, just to put it simply, it means that when we do things. When we act in this world, our actions have consequences. And this is part of um, the dignity that God has given to us as human beings. And he's given it to other creatures as well, to a lesser degree. So he's made us causes. And we have, if you like, the joy and responsibility of being causes. So that should rule out, to a very great extent, a kind of fatalistic view of, um, of the future and of divine providence as well. Um, the metaphysically precise way of talking about this in the Western tradition is about the distinction between primary and secondary causality. So there is a sense in which God is the cause of everything, which is primary causality. But there's also a sense in which within that sovereignty, as we call it, within that providence, uh, there are secondary causes as well, uh, which we as human beings are, we're secondary causes. So we have agency, we have free will, not completely unbounded free will, but we have a freedom of the will. And that, um, that has an effect um, and it flows from our decisions and or it flows through our decisions and so on and so forth. So, um, so we, don't, we don't say, like Muslims sometimes say, inshallah, you know, the Lord wills it and sort of, and, 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 and therefore, um, excuse ourselves of any responsibility but we are we're involved in the world as causal agents um in a significant way that said uh we're also extremely limited and the influence and impact we can have on the on the scenarios and environments around us are 
are limited for that reason. So, so whether we involve ourselves in certain things and the extent to which we do ex- involve ourselves in certain things uh, requires prayer and it requires uh, wisdom and it re- requires prudential thinking. Um, so, so we can't do everything. Only God can do everything. And, and realizing our, our limitations and our finitude is, is a part of what it means to have godly wisdom, wisdom and, and understanding what those are. So, you know, the, the, the serenity prayer, uh, God, uh, grant me the, um, what is it? Grant me, to, um, grant me the power to change what I can. Um, the humility, I'm, I'm not getting this right, but you know, the humility to, to, to not change what we can't and the grace to know the difference or whatever it is. Um, the point being that there are some things that God calls us to be involved in. Uh, God calls us to make a change. Um, there are some things that we, uh, we, we can't change because they're outside of our control and it requires prudence to know the difference between those two things. Now, what we know for sure is that God brings into our lives, puts things in front of us, which he does call us to be, um, to be involved in. Uh, we, he does call us um, to, to, um, to interact with, if you like. So just to give a, an example, with your family, with the people you live with, with your, with your friends or your community or the church you're part of or the job that you work or the responsibilities that you've been given. Uh, you can't just say, well, I'm not really sure God is calling me to these things and maybe I'll go and do this thing over there. No, you're called to those things because those things are a part of your life already and you can clearly have an impact on them. And, and, and clearly you're called by God to have a certain attitude of love and, and, and grace and service and humility towards them and so forth. So, so, so yeah, you are called by God to do something about those things. Now, whether you can change a situation on the other side of the world or whether you can have an impact on geopolitical events or whether you can have an impact on even local political events or whatever it might be, that's another question. Sometimes God opens doors for us to walk through. And sometimes those doors are quite extraordinary. Um, they, and, and there are individuals who have extraordinary, um, influence in society of course there are um but but um sometimes and let's face it most of the time uh we're actually just caused to called to have um influence on um on an on a very local and limited level and a lot of the time it's just about um growing in holiness ourselves and focusing on ourselves and and um our own our own walk with the lord and being as holy as, as we possibly can in the environments um, to which we're called. So that would be my answer um, to that one. And I hope it's helpful. And um, I'll leave it there for question, Rev. Um, but I do really like those questions. They're really good um, to, get the, uh, to get the mind ticking over. So I'm hopeful that next week Daniel's going to be back um, because it, it's nice, isn't it, to have a bit of interaction between the hosts. But I hope also that you've enjoyed uh, listening to me uh, going on for however long, lost track of the time, to be honest, I don't know how long I've been talking, uh, but I hope you found uh, found it interesting. And just a reminder that if you have enjoyed the show, you can you can support us on Patreon or you can buy us a coffee uh, at buymeacoffee.com. And all of the information uh, for this is available on our website, uh, irreverendpod.com. So do get to that website and then uh, get sharing. Um, do share the show with with your family and friends and on your social media as much as you possibly can. If you see, for example, that we've shared it on Twitter, just retweet it. Don't just like it, but retweet it as well. Do a retweet. It doesn't take less than a second, and that will just increase our visibility. Also, do leave us um, a rating and review on iTunes as that helps us in the algorithm as well so that people can see us. That kind of thing is really, really helpful. It's something you can do uh, if you enjoy the show um, to support what we're doing here. Um, but that is, uh, that's the end of the show for now. And, um, I actually going to finish if I can find it with, um, a, a collect from the book of common prayer. Um, and it's the, it's the collect for this, uh, week. And, uh, I thought it was a particularly nice one. So, um, let us pray. Lord of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of thy name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of thy great mercy keep us in the same, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Okay, well, as I say, I really hope you've enjoyed this episode of Irreverent. And I'm looking forward to being with you again, as always, next time. Bye for now.